This is from a mother who has not only been learning herself from the ridiculously effective parenting training, but as she watches it, her 10-year-old daughter watches it with her. That's very smart because they really get this. And now everybody's on the same page. Everybody understands the rules. The, the children understand mm, you have to keep the rules too. If there's zero tolerance for anger and all these other things, mm, they don't get to do it either. They like being on the same page. Otherwise, parenting usually just seems like this arbitrary dictatorship. So they've been sharing it. And mom writes and says, my 10-year-old daughter said that there's a boy in her class with anger issues all the time. And then she added, quote, 10-year-old, I feel so good, she says to her mother, because you helped me learn that I don't have to be afraid of him. He's not angry at me. He's just in pain, end quote. Wow. When we understand that somebody is in pain, our entire view of them and the situation changes. Now they're lashing out is not scary, it's just understandable. Their antisocial behavior makes sense instead of being puzzling and mysterious. And understanding them unavoidably, automatically leads to more tolerance and even compassion. Think how the world would change if we all understood just this. There would be no more bad people, well, just people in pain and doing their best to survive. And sometimes we actually have to interfere with their choices if they're killing people, for example. But mm -hmm, we're not scared and we're not judgmental and we're not angry, which just makes things worse. We can understand this and we can teach it to our kids. We can. You just heard a 10-year-old child learn this principle. Most 60-year-old children don't understand this principle. Next subject. This person says, I listen to you on Facebook every morning. Real love brought love back to my marriage. That was unexpected because the, this, these conversations are at least nominally about child, parenting and children. But when you become more loving to your children, you become more loving to everybody. It's, you just can't help yourself. So she says, it brought love back to my marriage. We're much happier as a couple. We're happier as a family. Our children are happier. She says, I did two book clubs with other moms supporting each other. My husband is a great cheerleader. He encourages me to do this, but he doesn't get involved himself. You know, he doesn't like watch the training. He doesn't go to the book clubs. He doesn't watch the Facebook lives, but he did see you in a short introduction. And he told me that he liked you. Maybe I should run for office. <laughs> he, was, he was open to my idea to listen together as a family. And he's happier. That's why he's cheering you on. Very wise of you to persist in learning to love and to share that with everybody, even though he doesn't actively participate in an obvious, visible way in the loving process. He's observing and he's enjoying what you're doing. Whoa, <laughs> hallelujah, that's pretty good. It often takes unconditional love from just one person to change a marriage and an entire family. It's got to start with somebody. If we sit around and wait for somebody else to start it, nothing happens. If I don't do it, who? If not now, when? You've heard that before. Mom says, so I know there are layers to learn and we're still mostly on rocky roads. We're, it's bumpy as we're learning. And if I'm drowning, I need to get myself to the boat first thing each day and then help pull everybody else in the family into the boat with me. Oh, that's a lovely metaphor. Brilliant. You could easily complain that nobody's helping you, like your husband, and whine about it as some parents choose to do, but then you lose. Now he doesn't feel loved. Um, you don't feel loving. And the whole family loses. It takes one person to change an environment or a situation or a family. Mom says, I did one thing that you recommended immediately. 
You said that it would make a difference if I checked on my children every hour while they're at home, just for five minutes. Love them proactively before they become demanding or whining or act out. So I did that. They loved it. Just the other day, for the first time I can ever remember, I ended up putting a together a puzzle with one child for over an hour and we enjoyed our time together. The results were that quick. It's because you took action. We've talked about that before. How lovely to hear and how perfect for you. Without action, the principles mean nothing. Really. She says, what I'm having a hard time with now is one of my sons. He's addicted to gaming and also watches inappropriate things. In other words, he's a porn addict too. But he comes to me and tells me what he's done, which is amazing. It really is. He even blocked all of his sites that he's used before and made me a password, but then he finds ways around it. But he's trying to stop. It's a good start. He's an unusual addict. He can feel that his addictions are not making him happy. Many addicts who've been in pain all of their lives, when the pain becomes a little less, when they use whatever, drugs, alcohol, porn, videos, anger, whatever, they confuse less, hap less pain with happy. Your son hasn't gotten to that point yet. He's feeling that his addictions just aren't quite right, meaning, they don't contribute to his happiness. And probably he notices that even more now that you're loving the family better. He can see the contrast between his pain relief and the real happiness that comes from you sitting with him and putting a puzzle together for an hour. Blocking websites and checking the computer sometimes are helpful with addictions, but real addicts will do anything, all caps, to use and to decrease their pain why they're addicts. They lose their ability to make rational choices. Pain does that. Like the French philosopher Proust said, to kindness and goodness we make promises, but pain we obey. We do. Boy, we were slaves to it. So in order to help your son, who has tried other things, as have you, I heartily recommend that you try something more effective. Why not? You've tried things that don't work. Why not try something that does work? Completely remove all access to electronic devices. Put a password on your uh, router, on your Wi-Fi, so that he can't even get, he can't even connect to the internet, where only you and your husband and wh whoever qualifies can do that for at least six months. Now, many parents would think, that sounds kind of harsh. No, it's what's necessary. What's necessary is just necessary. You don't describe it as harsh. Is it harsh that a cancer patient has to undergo chemotherapy for X months and has to show up exactly on these days and take their treatment at exactly these times for X long, and then sometimes that doesn't work and they have to go do it again? Is that harsh? Oh, I don't know. I guess, who cares? It's just necessary. If a cocaine addict goes in for treatment, they don't monitor their cocaine use. Um, they don't make it harder to get. They don't decrease the frequency of use. They stop it completely. And some inpatient recovery programs have a minimum stay of six months. Every addiction recovery program recognizes that until somebody has been off their substance or behavior for at least six to 12 months. That's a beginning. That's like opening the door or more. Then the, the addict simply doesn't know what, so pay attention to these next three words, doesn't know what sober feels like. Sobriety is a feeling. It's not the number of days you haven't used. Notice being off your addictive substance or behavior doesn't mean you're sober because you still want it, you still think about it, and if you're stressed, you'd use it. If you're sufficiently stressed, you'd use it again and again and again. Real sobriety means that you know, listen closely, because sobriety, sobriety is clearly defined almost nowhere. 
Some people say, well, it just means you never use again. No, no. I've been to 12-step recovery meetings where people stand up and say, I've been sober for 25 years. And you take one look at the face of the person who says, I've been sober for 25 years, and you realize that they're saying, I haven't drunk alcohol in 25 years, but I'm addicted to 15 other behaviors and substances. They're not happy. Real sobriety means that you know what a happy life is like from personal experience, not just you've read about it, without using any addiction. And you choose real happiness. That's sobriety. This whole thing is the definition of sobriety. You choose real happiness, not just the reduction of pain. That's sober. And as long as using is even a remote possibility, the addict doesn't feel free. And given enough pressure, they'll use. I suggest you re-listen to that definition of sobriety. Mom says, thank you for teaching me the, that the root is not the addiction. The root, root problem is the lack of real love in myself or my husband or both. Oh, that's brave. If all parents said that, they'd begin to change. Keep loving him. Keep teaching him. The elimination of electronics here isn't really a consequence, as I've described consequences on many occasions. It's not. It's a loving act to help him avoid the destruction of his addiction so that he can begin to feel your love. Sobriety isn't happiness. It's the ability to choose happiness. We talked about that. Being sober from a substance doesn't make you happy. It simply eliminates the destruction that prevents you from any possibility of happiness. As long as he's addicted, he'll be too numbed out to feel your love. By helping him to be sober, you just make it possible for him to feel your love and to learn and to grow. I was, some, I think somebody sent me this link because I don't surf the net looking for stuff. Unless I have a specific question. And somebody sent me this. And the post said, Dear parents, don't stress about schoolwork. In September, I will get your children back on track. I'm a teacher, and that's my superpower. What I can't fix is social emotional trauma that prevents the brain from learning. So right now, I just need you to share your calm, share your strength, and share your laughter with your children. No kids are ahead. No kids are behind. Your children are exactly where they need to be with love. All the teachers on planet Earth. Huh. Clever. Whether any particular teacher will be this compassionate, whether they all are, is not the point. The point nicely made is that teachers cannot heal the wounds that we inflict on our children by failing to love them unconditionally. And yet parents do expect that everywhere. I know a great number of teachers, and they report almost without exception that their biggest problems are not the children. It's the parents. If a child fails a test or gets a consequence for some unacceptable behavior, the parent comes to the school enraged that the school would dare to not coddle their child as they're coddled at home. How dare you not enable my child? <laughs> now, you have to achieve this, the parent speaking to the school, you have to achieve everything that you're supposed to achieve with teaching and responsibility and all that, but you also have to enable my child simultaneously. Excuse me? The parents cause the entitlement and the anger in the first place, and then they resent any attempts made to alter the behavior of the child that would negatively, the behaviors that negatively affect the child and other children. We have to learn to love and teach them or they can't be happy, and they can't learn at school. And while we're doing that, we can at least stop inflicting the wounds that result from anger and criticism. And while we're doing that, we can support whatever the teachers are trying to do with them while we're learning to love and teach. Teachers don't ever need our criticism. Done now? We're already making their job hard enough. New subject. This is a mother who uh, reported that just that day, that evening, 
her 11 year old, 11 year old daughter had given her the finger. For those of you who don't know the finger, uh, it is the physical manifestation of drop dead. It's the ultimate uh, ultimate disrespect that you can do non-verbally, pretty much, short of a bullet. And the therapist of the child, which should tell you something right off, the child at 11 has a therapist, said, oh, it's no big deal. It's just a finger. <laughs> like it's just a bullet. Bullets are fairly unremarkable when they're not being fired too. And the friends are all saying, oh, it's just part of being 11. Everybody was ignoring this. Like, what's the big problem? So she gave you the finger. Um, wrong, completely wrong, dead wrong, couldn't be wronger. This is information about what's going on underneath the surface. A lot that's going on. No child begins to just, no child who's happy, just begins to flip off their parent, just gives them the finger, you know, accidentally. Then it might be just a finger, but they don't do it. I'm saying, as I've said before, that we have to truly listen to our children, to every sign of unhappiness, every sign. And mom is not paying attention. Neither is the therapist, neither is anybody else. Let me illustrate this with a metaphor. One day I crossed the creek out back, not far from here, over the bridge, went to the brush pile that I had to regularly and then burn from time to time. And the brush pile is the base of a man-made dam um, that is 12, 15 feet high, maybe more, and about a thousand feet long that contains about a 10 acre lake, approximate. I'm not gonna go out and measure it so I can make sure I've got it right. And I noticed that there was a shallow pool of water extending away from the brush pile. Not real wide, but ran probably 100 feet along the base of the dam and the pool of water was maybe three inches deep. And after there's been a really heavy rain, that's not all that rare. It's mostly clay and so the water sits there till it evaporates or finds a hole somewhere. But there had been no rain for days. And here was this little pool of clear water. Kind of pretty actually, a lake, a lake in front of the lake at the base of the dam. So I knew the water had to come from somewhere and water always runs downhill. So there had to be a leak in the dam, which doesn't delight me. So I scraped with a pitchfork the entire 100 feet of the lake side of the pool. Scraped it back to see if I could find the little river of water that's running from the dam down into this little pool because the water has, to, water has to be coming from somewhere. So for 100 feet, I'm taking this pitchfork and I'm hearing, and I'm listening carefully, just as we do diligently with a child. So I scrape, scrape, scrape 100 feet of this. And finally, in one little area, maybe 18 inches wide, the sound changed from scrape, scrape to much softer muted, meaning the soil was softer. There was no stream of water, which is what I thought I was gonna find. There was nothing obvious. So I began to dig and I found under the surface of the dirt, a small seeping stream, like 18 inches wide, then 12 inches wide. And I kept digging a ditch up the side of the dam. And the deeper I went and the higher I went, eventually after about 12 feet of maybe more of trenching, I found an actual hole running water like a mm, hose, garden hose running at oh, low to medium rate, mm, running down from the dam, which is 30 feet through a solid, solid clay into my little pool. The hole, incidentally, I hadn't intended this when I when I found it, obviously, this little hole was about the size of an 11 year old's middle finger. Ironic, huh? So I kept exploring up the dam and I found a muskrat hole that had been dug in the dam. I had to excavate tons of clay, tons of clay, make a dam 
are in the lake, in the water, around the muskrat hole, pack it down, and after making that dam, then dig out the entire length of the leak, and finally pack the clay into the trench, plugging both the animal den and the hole. That took a lot of work and tons of material, only because we'd been really observant in the beginning with the tiny pool of water, finding the leak, and then that led to moving tons of dirt. I made su some suggestions to this mother about the supposedly tiny leak. She ignored them. She stopped the girl's allowance for a day, a day, one day. This girl gets paid, gets paid off every day. Mother tried to stop the leak in the dam with a paper towel, as most parents try to do, but it never, ever works. I can just picture me out there sopping up the leaking water with paper towels, which is what mom's doing. Within a couple of days, the child had hit the mother in the face and horrible words were exchanged and things have escalated and the child is well on her way to a lot more trouble than neither the mother or the child can imagine until mom is willing to dig up the dam, find the source of the leak and really fix it. It's gonna keep leaking. And I've seen what can happen to a leak in the dam. You can go from a, I'm not gonna illustrate the thing, well, this finger, <laughs> You can go from a leak in a dam this big to losing the entire lake in minutes. Minutes. I was fortunate that we didn't. So much is going on underneath as this water is softening the soil and, and eroding the structure of the dam and the hole can just blow out. We have to address these little leaks in our children, these little behaviors, these little fingers. Because a dam collapsing for a child means depression or other mental illness, it means addictions, it means horrifying relationships, it means no job for the rest of her life. It can mean suicide or accidental death, drunk driving or whatever. This child's in deep trouble. Flipping off her mother and hitting her? What she's openly declaring is that she believes that she runs her own little world and nobody has any business telling her what to do ever. And what's mom doing so far? Nothing. What could she do? As in today, it's right this second, today, before the end of the day, she could take away every single thing this child values as a privilege. We're, we're, we're not at the doing half measures place now. Phone, money, credit card, the door in her room, get creative, and then she can earn it back as she learns to behave like a human being, as opposed to a completely frightened, out of control, angry monster. Or mom can wait to, to hear that her daughter is pregnant, dead in a car accident, cutting herself, dead from an overdose in jail, and on and on. Because one, one or more of those things will happen. This is why we have to pay attention to every little leak. Every huffy attitude, every grade, every disregard of responsibility, every moment of selfishness, every tone of voice is a leak. Now, I'm not suggesting that we be the police, be inspecting like that. No, I'm saying we'd have to be more aware and have to love and teach with every leak that we see because it's an indication of something more going on underneath and deeper in. Always. Because happy children don't do this stuff at all. They have no need to. Or we lose them. We lose them often to death. And we don't have a right to be surprised then or even sorry, we, we caused it, we ignored it. The time to do something is now, not later. I get calls from parents when their children have died and they didn't do anything. Not so fun. Find the leak while it's the size of a finger. Much wiser way to go and happier. We can all learn to do that. I'll see you tomorrow.